I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Kirkpatrick, the program director for the main chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And uh, he's kindly uh, accepted to join us today to give us a lot of great information about dementia and Alzheimer's. So I appreciate that we were able to thank you, uh, come today. So thank you. Appreciate it very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, first time I've been on your campus up here. It's beautiful, beautiful uh, buildings. Um, and it's, it's always nice when the technology works as I reach my technolo technological prowess very quickly. So it's nice when things actually pull together. So this is a program called Know the Ten Signs, Early Detection Matters, and it's part of what we call our common program plan. We have a set of programs that we offer to the community, people living with uh, dementia, their family members, um, and people interested in things like this, uh, memory loss, those kinds of things. Um, and common program meaning that this is a program offered by all of the Alzheimer's chapters across the country. The Alzheimer's Association is a national organization, nonprofit. Uh, we have over 70 chapters um, across the country. In Maine, we have one chapter that covers the state, and we're located in Scarborough. My job as program director is to uh, oversee all of our education and training programs training in that we um, provide professional training as well. Um, I also oversee our helpline services, and there are brochures in the back of the room where you have them, I guess. This is our helpline number. It's an 800 number. Um, and there are trained masters uh, prepared clinicians on the other end of that phone um, that can help answer questions or provide guidance and counseling related to issues about living with Alzheimer's dealing with uh, some of the challenging behaviors that occur. Um, we do have a local number, a main number, of course, but we do advertise the 800 number because when people need to get access to somebody to talk about these kinds of things, we want to make sure they get a live person. So it's certainly for people living with a the disease, their caregivers, the professionals, but it's, it's available to you as well. And you can call this number. It's a free service. If you have any questions or wanted to follow up with any of this information, or learn more about that, you can either call directly to the main chapter, and my card is over there as well, or you can certainly call the uh, 800 number. Um, this brochure, Know the Ten Signs, has the listing of the signs in it, so don't feel like you have to jot down all the signs or take a lot of notes. Um, it's right there in the uh, brochure. And um, if you go to the website, uh, which is on the brochure as well, um, you will be able to get all the background, and lots of detailed information about, um, about um, most of this. A third brochure that I brought is uh, The Basics of Alzheimer's Disease, which goes into some detail about this as well. Um, so this is a, sort of a small enough audience to take questions or issues um, during the presentation, so we can be happy to do that. Um, first, I wanted to acknowledge um, and um, express appreciation for the funding for this program, uh, which is through the American Express Members Project. Uh, Jay Smith, who is a, a employee, of, employee of the company, promoted the idea for this program because his wife, Patty, was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's disease in her early 50s, which is referred to as younger onset Alzheimer's disease. And he did not have good access. He did not have good information uh, following her diagnosis um, and believed that this program, by funding it, that he could help other people learn about the disease and get the support and the help they needed earlier on in the process. So we're very fortunate to have the, the funding for the program. Um, in all of our programs, we start with an overview of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And throughout this program, as we're going through the signs, um, I'll be contrasting typical aging, the things that happen to all of us as part of normal aging, and the signs and symptoms of dementia, which are not normal aging. Uh, so there's a real clear differentiation. So first, I want to talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. I want to start with a second uh, arrow, though, and talk about dementia as a term. This is a term that you might be familiar with. Um, and it is a condition uh, that describes signs and symptoms that can occur in many different kinds of disorders. 
So I compare dementia as a term or a condition to cancer as a condition or depression as a condition. There are many different types of cancers, many different types of depressions, and many different types of dementias. I often, we often get the question, is, is Alzheimer's dementia, is dementia Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's disease causes dementia. So dementia is the signs of the brain damage that is occurring. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. So it represents about 60 or 65 percent of all of the cases. But there are dozens of types of dementias uh, that have been identified. And we'll, we'll touch on some of the common ones. So Alzheimer's is a disease of the brain that causes um, the cell destruction that leads to problems with um, behavior, thinking, uh, memory, and other cognitive functions. It's a progressive disease, prog progressive dementia, meaning that the symptoms get worse over time, that people uh, need more and more help over time, and it ends in death. So it is a fatal disease. There is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we'll get to the, uh, the uh, sort of risk factors in a minute. But that's what we mean by a progressive dementia. There are reversible you know, or non-progressive types of dementias as well. Uh, but this, this is the uh, sort of description of what Alzheimer's disease is. We do have some treatments. I'll talk to you about that a little bit. But the treatments we have treat symptoms. Uh, it does not treat the underlying disease process itself. So a lot of what we focus on is uh, research. There are over 130 clinical trials across the country looking for more effective drugs, looking for a cure for Alzheimer's, um, looking to identify more advanced imaging studies, MRIs, those kinds of things that can detect the disease earlier and earlier. Psychosocial studies uh, measuring, dealing with stress. Um, and uh, if you have any interest in any of those uh, research um, studies, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, for you about that. And actually, I read about um, the outcome of some three research studies um, that uh, seem to indicate that there are those folks who are aware of and, and begin to express concern about cognitive changes long before the symptoms emerge or long before the, the symptoms are obvious. And that, that early self-awareness, that subjective awareness of the symptoms actually may be a very reliable early detection for the disease. So what these three studies did was look at groups of people who were being evaluated cognitively on an ongoing basis. And for the subset of those folks who were beginning to self-report changes, um, it turns out that a larger percentage of those folks went on to develop mild cognitive impairment or dementia at early stages of the research, and it's not really for sure, but it's very intriguing. And a, a big part of what we talk about uh, in research is early detection. So let's talk about risk factors. The biggest risk factor is age. We're an aging society. More and more people are living longer. And so in a sense, you know, years ago, we used to live shorter lives and we would die of other things like pneumonia or the, you know, other uh, diseases. Now we're living long enough <coughs> to be eligible, so to speak, for uh, the disease to show up and for it to uh, cause death. Um, because women live longer than men, the incidence uh, or risk is uh, elevated or higher for, uh, for, for women. Um, there is a uh, genetic factor here. There is a uh, uh, a link, genetic link to different types of Alzheimer's. And so there are really sort of three types or three areas of genetic connection here. Uh, one is called a uh, risk association. Most of the cases of Alzheimer's, for instance, um, uh, are occurring to people in their 60s, 65 years and older. And that's what we refer to as late onset disease. And so for those folks, um, there is, for a good proportion of those uh, individuals, they will have a particular gene, the APOE-E4. And actually, all of us inherit the APOE gene. So that what happens is some mechanism, and we're not quite sure what happens, uh, creates a risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So for the late onset type, if you inherit, if you have this 
dash E4 gene, that means you have an elevated risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to get the Alzheimer's disease. So there's another genetic variant called the deterministic or familial uh, version of the disease, which occurs under the age of 65. And that um, means that three types of APOE genes, uh, E2, E3, and E4, are implicated. Um, and that is a deterministic gene, which means that if you do have those genes, you will develop the disease. And then there's another variant that, are, that impacts very young, early on in their uh, folks in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Very small number of families around the world, probably 5% of the total number of cases have that variant of, of, of genetics. So if, if you have a family history of parent, grandparents, um, siblings, aunts and uncles who, who have Alzheimer's disease, then that does raise your risk. It doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. It's very similar to having cancer or heart disease or another illness or disease in your family. It means your risk for those diseases, if they're genetically determined, is elevated. It doesn't mean you're going to get them. It just means you're at risk, elevated risk. So uh, there is a genetic link. Um, the older onset, the late onset, is the, uh, the most common type and across the country. There are 5.1, 5.2 million people who have Alzheimer's disease. Of that 5 million number, about 200,000 of those have that younger onset variety. So it's obviously a very small number of that larger number, but nonetheless, uh, it is there. Um, people ask about whether you should, you know, we should have genetic testing or not. Is that a good or a bad thing? I, oh, we always refer people back to their primary care physician. We do have a genetic testing uh, fact sheet. If you're interested in uh, uh, getting a copy of that or talking more about that, that would be a good reason for calling the helpline, actually, um, either locally to our number or the 800 numbers to talk through and then get access to those, that sort of genetic information. Any questions about the family history? So this age is the biggest risk factor. Uh, family uh, history is another factor. Uh, but very, very compelling evidence and research about the link between the body and brain connection. And the reason why I say compelling evidence is that there, there is very clear observation and clear evidence in the literature uh, that brain health comes from a healthy body and healthy lifestyle. We know that the risk for Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease is elevated in people with cardiovascular disease. Um, damage to the heart or blood vessels. We know that the risk for dementia is elevated in people who develop diabetes in midlife. Uh, and there is a very strong link, if not proven link now, between head trauma and dementia. And we see this played out very dramatically in the National Football League. There are a number of football players who are demonstrating or manifesting many of these symptoms we're going to talk about. And some of them have, uh, upon autopsy, it's determined that they have a condition or a brain disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is very severe destruction of the brain related to uh, the result of multiple head trauma. Um, there was a recent uh, documentary on, faith, on um, Frontline called League of Denial, which really focused on that and the commissioner just recently announced a settlement of a lawsuit without any um, admission of responsibility or connection, by the way, um, that, that, that head trauma can cause dementia. Uh, it does, and so there's very, very high risk for that. There's much more, thankfully, much more uh, um, focus on that in assessment. As a matter of fact, just the other day, um, Brett Favre, who's the former quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, talked about the fact that he is now uh, manifesting symptoms. And many of the NFL players are talking about not allowing their kids to play football because of the work. So I'm not advocating that people shouldn't play football, but there is an awareness factor here that's really important to understand what the risk factors is, uh, are. Yes? Um, we noticed in my family, my mother has been diagnosed with dementia a few years ago. Yes. She went through neurological Shortly after she had congestive heart failure, or whatever, and yeah. 
although we weren't told that was the reason, that's what we believe that the damage occurred maybe during her episode with the congestive heart failure. Well, I think it's a separate process, but what may happen is that when someone has, it may go hand in hand with a heart, um, sort of general heart disease or cardiovascular disease that essentially interrupts the healthy blood flow to the brain that renders a brain more vulnerable to the process of the brain cell death associated with Alzheimer's disease. And so you may be familiar with the term plaques and tangles. That's the buildup of certain proteins in the brain within the brain cells and between the brain neurons uh, that is most scientists believe are, uh, uh, and know are implicated in the development of Alzheimer's disease. We're not quite sure what then happens that sort of turns that process on. Many of us will have those, some of those plaques and tangles, but some people will, that, that process gets turned on and it's, it, it continues to happen. What occurs with illness is it sets the stage for a vulnerability in the brain. Um, and so we talk about capacity, cognitive capacity. And um, if someone has had a major illness or a major change in their life, symptoms emerge, it appears as if there's a direct cause and effect. But what might also be happening is that the person was able to function independently with some of these symptoms, but they're very subtle and not noticed. And then something occurs, a very dramatic change in someone's life, an illness or uh, a death or a move or something, and then all of a sudden it appears that they're having difficulty cognitively or that the spouse dies, the spouse sort of fills in the gaps for the person and helps them maintain independence. The spouse dies, the healthy spouse dies, and then all of a sudden, mom or dad uh, looks you know, like they're having many of these signs we're going to talk about. Um, did, the, did the death of the spouse cause the dementia? No, but it uncovers an already declining or problematic uh, cognitive status. So the health status is an important piece of that, and it really kind of sets the stage or leads leads to some mechanism that that, you know, that opens up the possibility of Alzheimer's or another dementia. It's not uncommon for people to go to a physician and go through a workup, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and then come away with a diagnosis of dementia as the general term or condition, because we don't really have one test that can tell us that somebody has Alzheimer's disease. It is in many cases, the outcome of a very rigorous workup. And most physicians are pretty accurate of saying at the end of that, it looks like Alzheimer's. Uh, but many people walk away with a very general diagnosis of dementia uh, because you know, we're not able to get there specifically. Uh, and there are other, and we think it's important to get a diagnosis because there are many different types of dementia and they look differently symptom symptomatically. So we think it's important to uh, get that. So did I answer did I answer this one? So let's get into the warning signs. And what I'd like to do as we go through this is again sort of contrast uh, you know normal aging, typical aging, the things that happen to you and me as we grow older typically, and the signs and symptoms of um, dementia. So the first is memory changes that disrupt daily life. And one of the key things is that um, it's related to these cognitive signs or symptoms that disrupt normal life. So we're not talking about simple forgetfulness here. You know, how many of us have gotten up from the TV to go in the other room to get something and we stop and we forget why we're in the other room? Um, I'll admit to that, that happens all the time. How many of us have sort of had trouble recalling a name or had some word finding problems now and again or you misplace your keys? That happens as we grow older or cognitively we slow down. Um, but for people with Alzheimer's disease, this is often one of the first symptoms to emerge because the part of the brain that's responsible for taking in newly learned information and storing it is affected first. And so, this, and, and, and that, that disruption begins to interfere with a person's ability to manage their day-to-day -day life. So that, that key word is disrupt daily life. So forgetting something recently learned because the person's not, not able to retain the information, they may ask the same information over and over again or ask the same question over and over again. Uh, and they may start to use memory aids or rely on family members to sort of fill in the gaps. So it's that example of the spouse that sort of covers for the person um, for their uh, memory. 
So number two is uh, challenges in planning or solving problems. Um, so for many of us, who, you know, in terms of typical or normal aging, uh, from time to time we may um, just struggle with making some plans um, or following through. We might, um, you know, forget something now and again related to uh, paying a bill. Of that, uh, or another example. But for someone with Alzheimer's disease, um, this also can be something that begins to emerge early. Uh, and some of the examples of that is, again, not following the plan from start to finish, taking longer to do things that, that normally uh, the person would, uh, would need. Uh, challenges with concentration, so being distracted a little bit, so that it uh, bumped off task, if you will. Um, examples would be, uh, if someone is follow if uh, working still or is in charge of balancing the checkbook, um, they begin to have difficulty with balancing the checkbook. They may make mistakes. Um, uh, they may leave an ingredient out of a familiar recipe because it's not being able to follow a plan, perhaps a recipe that they cooked or baked for many years. Um, so the differentiation here is these symptoms disrupt normal life or a familiar life. Now, let me stop and say that as we go through these 10 signs, these, this is not a diagnostic test. It doesn't mean if you have one or more of these symptoms that you have Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Uh, um, it's uh, it likely not, most, for the most part, that's not the case. But it is a sign that means something's happening in the brain and it's wise to check it out. So uh, these signs and symptoms can be caused by a lot of different kinds of conditions and situations. Yeah. Number three is difficulty completing familiar tasks. So once again, as we age or grow older, um, we, uh, we, we may get distracted from a task, we may get sort of fatigued, or uh, we may kind of lose interest in a, in a favorite game now and again. But for someone with Alzheimer's disease, they will begin to show difficulty in completing daily normal tasks, activities of daily living, ADLs, or those kinds of things. They, they will have difficulty or show some difficulty following the rules of a, a favorite game. Um, once again, the budget issue of uh, many folks with Alzheimer's uh, or other dementias are still working, and it may show up in terms of issues related to the budget or managing the budget of work. Um, and then trouble driving to a once familiar place. So as the brain is changing, as things are occurring, the individual is becoming a little bit more disoriented and the uh, usual cues that we don't really necessarily pay attention to, we just drive a little bit of drive, um, begin to be a bit of a challenge. And we'll see that happen a little bit more. Um, confusion with time and place. Um, so um, this occurs, I think, sometimes uh, occasionally uh, normally, uh, you might park your car at one end of the mall and go out another door and forget where you parked your car, um, forget where you are at one point. But for people with Alzheimer's disease, um, the issue of losing track of uh, dates, seasons, and passage of time um, begins to manifest itself very, uh, very significantly. Um, unless something's happening in the here and now, it's very difficult for someone who's having this symptom to appreciate what's happening tomorrow or what happened yesterday. So the concept of time begins to be problematic. Uh, and once again, sort of get disoriented um, with uh, where, one per where one is, or how they got there. <clears throat> Visual and spatial relationship problems. Um, you know, many of us go through some changes with vision. We need glasses, cataracts, that sort of thing. But the visual spatial relationships um, in terms of someone with Alzheimer's is in relation to what's happening in the occipital or parietal lobe of the brain, the vision or sensory centers of the brain. Um, and the person begins to have diminished capacity to track their usual visual surroundings. Um, they will have difficulty reading um, and, and uh, reading the, uh, the words in the book. They'll begin to have dif difficulties judging distances between themselves and others. Um, determining color and contrast will be an issue. This is where the driving issue becomes very problematic. Um, probably one of the most difficult discussions or issues that crops up 
with someone with Alzheimer's disease is the issue of when is it time to give up the keys. So when someone who has the disease reaches the middle stage of the disease, they will no longer be able to drive because of the accumulative uh, cognitive impairment. And this is a big one, the visual spatial relationship problem. Uh, number six is new problems with words and speaking and writing. Um, so, uh, again, who hasn't had the difficulty with uh, recalling a name or kind of getting lost in a sentence now and again or sort of searching for a word? But for someone with Alzheimer's disease, uh, this individual will have problems following the conversation and may get lost in that conversation. Or they might start, they might be talking about something and then get distracted and lose their train of thought and not be able to pick it up again, you know, where they left off in terms of the conversation. So they may stop in the middle and they may be unable to continue or start repeating what they may have said before. Um, they'll begin to have more and more problems with finding the right word uh, and some name problem, name, uh, uh, naming of objects uh, problems. So one of the uh, things that happen when someone goes to a physician when they first have some of these signs is that a primary care physician will do a simple memory test or, or uh, sort of a mental status exam, if you will, cognitive exam. And they'll ask a series of questions that relate to memory and recall, using words, following instructions, and naming objects. So one of the questions in one of the exams is, name this object. And if the person is having difficulty with this symptom, they may know what this is, but they may call it a hand clock instead of a watch. Or um, they may, the physician will hold up a pen, and the person won't be able to name it as a pen. So that's subtle symptoms or signs based on that very simple test that something's happening in the brain. Not necessarily Alzheimer's, but something is occurring that's disrupting the person's ability to, to name objects. <coughs> Number seven is misplacing things and, and, and losing the ability to retrace steps. So uh, who here has not misplaced an item or had trouble locating an item? Um, I joke that the wallet and fruit bowl is not outside of the realm of my possibility because the fruit bowl is right by the door and I put all sorts of stuff in my keys. So that's possible. But it's a really odd place. So finding um, a pair of shoes in the freezer or uh, you know a uh, the TV remote in the dryer or so, something really odd. And the key here is the person unable to retrace their steps to find the object. So if you and I replay, uh, miss, uh, misplace something or lose something, um, what do we do? We sort of go back through, well, where was the last time I remember seeing that or retracing your steps when you come in the front door? And for the most part, you can track it back. A person with Alzheimer's will not be able to do that. And then sometimes what happens is they will accuse somebody else of taking the item, because that explains why the item is uh, missing. Um, we get many calls like that over the helpline where a spouse or a family member is dealing with accusations and not really knowing or understanding where that's coming from. And along with that is a real increase in agitation and fear and anger about that, sort of displaced, if you will. Um, Decreased or poor judgment, uh, I'll, I'll go back and say something more about uh, something else in a minute, but changes in decision making and judgment. So who here has not made a bad decision in our lives? We all do. But for someone with Alzheimer's disease, this takes on uh, sort of a routine um, uh, uh, problem or issue because of the impact of judgment, uh, because of the impact of cognitive changes. The person will not be able to handle money very well or make bad choices, write a check to a telemarketer, use bad judgment around wearing warm clothes on a very cold day like that. Um, so those kinds of things really begin to stand out. Uh, big problem everywhere is the vulnerability of elders and being taken advantage of anyways. If someone is already cognitively compromised, they're that much more of a, of a sort of a target, if you will. Because they don't have the check and balance to sort of step, step back and say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Their judgment is impaired and more and more impaired. I, I, what I started to say before is that we're going through the sort of 
chronological order of, of symptoms. Um, and uh, the important thing to note here is that these symptoms don't come on like that. Um, that the very gradual onset, for the most part, particularly with Alzheimer's disease, it occurs over many, many years. Alzheimer's um, is occurring in an individual's brain for up to 15 to 20 years before the first symptoms emerge. And then the first symptoms are usually that memory impairment or problem solving. And if there's a spouse involved or family or the person themselves may have some cognitive reserve to kind of gloss over those early changes. So these can be very, very subtle and it's really only when there may be sort of an arresting moment, like someone gets lost to, to go out to church or go to a store and they come back three hours later because they got lost and it took them a while to come back. So some, or they accuse somebody of stealing. So sometimes the symptoms have been happening, the disease has been happening a while, and then there are these critical or crisis kinds of things that all of a sudden occur and uh, in sort of uh, uh, brings the situation to the fore. Number nine is withdrawal from work or social activities. Um, I think typically many of us don't want to socialize sometimes or go out after work or just be with family or friends if you want to be by yourself and read a book. But from, um, for someone with Alzheimer's disease, this, this takes on a, a pattern where the person begins to withdraw from hobbies, from friends, from social engagement. Uh, they may lose track of a favorite sports team or other hobby. Um, they begin to avoid social situations and I think most likely it's because they are experiencing and sensing uh, confusion in the outside world and inability to follow conversation, uh, difficulty understanding what other people are saying, and so there's a sort of natural inclination to withdraw. Uh, we encourage people when they're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or anywhere along the line uh, to stay engaged, social engagement, intellectual stimulation, because that can help prolong uh, sort of how the symptoms unfold over a longer period of time and help with quality of life. And then finally, changes in mood and personality. Um, all of us have probably been through our, our moods. We get grumpy or uh, crabby now and again. But for someone with Alzheimer's disease, mood and personality may emerge. And it's usually in the context of difficulty doing something or following through on something that they once were able to do. That example of accusing somebody of stealing might be uh, you know, combined with agitation and anger. Um, but the mood and personality is, uh, changes may be reflective, at least initially, primarily because of frustration and some confusion and, and a lack of awareness of what's happening and lots of fear and confusion emerge. Um, this can sometimes become more problematic, especially in terms of uh, agitation, anxiety, depression, and those conditions can be treated using uh, other medications, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so the name of this program is Know the Ten Signs, Early Detection Matters. So what should you do if you sort of become aware of one or more of these signs or symptoms in yourself or family or friends? Well, we want people to talk about it. We want them to get help. We want them to go check it out. There's a lot of stigma associated with Alzheimer's disease, very similar to the stigma that um, accompanied cancer many years ago. Um, I was a social worker. My, one of my first jobs as a social worker was on a cancer unit 30 or so years ago. And back in those days, people would not say they were cancer. Um, they would use euphemisms, tumor growth, or not talk about it at all. Over the years, that's changed a lot because there's been a lot of attention at destigmatizing the disease. We need to do that with Alzheimer's disease. People need to know what's happening to them so they have the ability to have some control over future plans and, and how to live life with Alzheimer's. People get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, it's a terminal illness, but they're not going to die tomorrow. They will live life with Alzheimer's disease, and part of this is helping them and helping their family live with Alzheimer's disease. So we want people to talk about it, go see their doctor, check, get a checkup, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that diagnostic workup that was referred to before. Um, earlier is better, of course. 
Um, it might not be Alzheimer's at all, and it probably isn't. Um, there are lots of conditions that can cause these signs, that, signs I just talked about. And if we, some of these are life-threatening, so if we ignore the signs, um, it, uh, it could be more problematic for the person. We actually could save somebody's life by pointing out that some, one of these signs has happened in the body. And we just, we, a lot of uh, the stigma, I think, causes people to ignore the signs and not check it out and not go to a physician or resist it. Um, and we're trying to reverse that, of course. So we talked a little bit, or referred to recent, uh, before to a diagnostic workup. Uh, we refer people back to the primary care physician. Um, so typically, physical exam, blood work, uh, urine work, that brief mental status exam, maybe a neurological exam in the office to, uh, to check balance or reflexes um, or sort of ability to walk, those kinds of things. Um, maybe some brain scans or CAT scan, MRI. Um, some people get referred to uh, diagnostic centers like Maine Medical Center uh, or other centers for a complete workup. There, the person would probably see a psychiatrist. They may uh, see a neuropsychologist, which um, goes into much more detail uh, psychological testing. But finally, the result of the end result of the workup is it allows the physician to identify disorders or causes of these symptoms um, and other kinds of symptoms that are, can, can occur in other kinds of dimensions. Um, but there are lots of other disorders, and this is a short list here, um, things that can cause memory loss or other symptoms include anemia, uh, certain uh, vitamin deficiencies, vitamin B12 deficiency, for example, excess use of alcohol or combining alcohol and other medications or drugs, medication side effects, certain infections, hypothyroidism, kidney and liver disease, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is a buildup of fluid in the brain. So there are a lot of conditions that can cause one or more of these signs. Um, and if you deal with it and get it treated, those signs or symptoms can, can uh, be, be cured or greatly diminished. This is a short list of other dimensions that I mentioned. Uh, I said that Alzheimer's uh, represents about 60, 65% of I give you that number of five million people across the country living with um, dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, um, uh, and dementias. Um, so Alzheimer's 60, 65%. Vascular dementia is the second most common type. So that is a, a vascular disease which can call, cause stroke or mini stroke in the frontal lobe. Um, and vascular disease can cause a dementia. That represents about 15 to 18%. Uh, frontotemporal dementia, which is a very complex condition, which involves changes or problems in the frontal, in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobes. Uh, I mentioned before that we think it's important to know what the dementias are because the symptoms can be a little different. So Alzheimer's typically starts with problems with memory and some executive functioning problem, problem solving. Um, a dementia like frontotemporal dementia or Lewy body dementia, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, can emerge more with psychiatric or behavioral symptoms. So that's one reason why it's important to know because it gives people, uh, helps people prepare for what is going to happen and how to deal with it. Uh, mixed dementia is uh, reflective of the fact that many people with Alzheimer's disease also have vascular dementia. So there's two types of dementia going on. Louis body dementia, um, Louis was a contemporary of Dr. Alzheimer who identified the very first case back in 1906, believe it or not. Good trivia question. Um, uh, Dr. Louis identified a different um, damage to the brain, different location of the brain that's now referred to as Louis body dementia. It's often connected to Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's dementia because some of the signs that, of Louis body dementia are that rigidity or tension or inability to uh, uh, to sort of have purposeful movement uh, of the body. And the diagnosis is a little tricky. So uh, if someone has Parkinson's disease diagnosed and they develop a dementia, that's dementia secondary to the Parkinson's disease. Someone with Lewy body dementia 
may go on to develop signs and symptoms that look like Parkinson's or Parkinson's um, signs. And that, that's considered a, a primarily a dementia. Uh, so that can be a little bit tricky. And there are other types of uh, uh, dementia. wernicke korsakoffs is a dementia associated with heavy and chronic alcohol use, um, more rare. Although when I talk to an audience of nurses, they tell me not so rare. They see it out there. Um, creutzfeldt jakob disease, very rare, which is a disease that can cause, that he can either, can spontaneously occur, very, very rare disease, can be caused by ingesting the, um, uh, it's basically the one variant of creutzfeldt jakob disease is the human version of mad cow disease, so if someone ingests uh, an infected cow or deer or moose, they could develop that kind of dementia. So there's lots and there's, there's dozens of other kinds of dementia. So what do you do if you get diagnosed? Well, we want, obviously, to, have, to, to talk about it. But getting early diagnosis allows the person to get, uh, take advantage of uh, available treatments. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so explore treatments to provide relief of symptoms. Early treatment may help the person live independently for a longer period of time. And also offers people a chance to participate in those clinical trials I mentioned. So we have a program called Trial Match. And some folks call the 800 number to find out about that. And that links you with our Trial Match consultant. So if you're interested in finding out whether you're eligible for a trial because you're interested in research. Many trials are looking for people who are nuts, they don't have the diagnosis, you know, they don't have the risk factors, but, but they need lots of controls for these clinical trials. Lots of trials don't get off the ground because we just don't have enough human subjects. So we invite everybody to consider checking out trial match to see if you're eligible for either a drug trial, an imaging study trial, psychosocial, trial and sort of thing. But it gives people a chance to uh, to check it out. We do have trials in Maine now and again. There's a trial in, now underway in Acadia Hospital. Dr. Singer is testing out a drug. Um, some neurologists in Southern Maine, um, Dr. Dinerstein and others also have had some trials. Um, we talked about medication for Alzheimer's disease and there are two classes of drugs but there are only really five or six drugs in those two classes. One is the so-called cholinesterase inhibitor, which may temporarily improve or slow down memory loss. Um, there's another class of drugs, is one drug called Namenda. So you might be familiar with Aricept, Exelon Patch, Razodyne, Namenda. Those are really the four, there's another one that's not as used as much. Those are really the four drugs that are prescribed by physicians and can help symptomatically, but you might recall what I said before, that these drugs do not interrupt the course of the disease. They are not disease-modifying drugs. They're, they treat symptoms. Uh, other drugs can help with mood or behavior, depression, anxiety, uh, hallucinations. Um, and you know, talking to someone's physician about that is important. It helps people with early detection also have more time to plan for the future. There are lots of things to consider. Has the person executed a living will or durable power of attorney to appoint somebody else to make decisions for them? By the time they get to middle stage or beyond, they will not have decision-making capacity to do that. So the earlier the better. <coughs> uh, making living arrangements for the future. Uh, making safety adjustments within the home initially to allow the person to live uh, independently longer. Um, financial and legal uh, matters need to be taken care of. Maybe it's important to see uh, an elder law attorney or an attorney related to that. Um, it allows the person with the disease to be able to participate in decision making. That's a huge problem. I think many, many family members, because of that stigma, um, or spouse, resist the notion or refuse to talk about it with their family member. Or they forbid physicians or other uh, health care providers about talking about the disease. Um, people have a right to know. You have a right. We all have a right to know what our diagnosis is. And 
uh, and earlier the better because again it allows us to make plans for the future and participate in those plans. It also allows the person to build the right care team. So what I mean by that is when you think about the person with Alzheimer's as the center of our care, uh, the team really includes spouse, family, friends, neighbors, clergy, uh, agencies, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, Seniors Plus here in Lewiston, whatever it is in the community that can help surround that person with support, loving, caring, um, and, and help to sort of promote quality of life. Um, so I've already mentioned making legal plans, uh, 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 medical and treatment decisions, finances, naming a person. And part of that healthcare team or that uh, care team is uh, the Alzheimer's Association. Um, we have lots of, of these programs and services. Most of them are free. Um, our care consultation and information and referral services access to the helpline. I, I oversee the helpline and so I, I talk to people every day who are dealing with either a new diagnosis or an issue of stigma, the driving question, safety issues. We do a, a very uh, comprehensive safety assessment because we know, even if it's an early stage, we know what's going to happen down the road because of the progressive dementia. Um, so we ask questions about what the person is able to do now. Are they using appliances? Are they using, do they have, are there any weapons in the home? Um, power tools, wood stoves, are they driving? Uh, and so part of it is education about what will happen in terms of their capacity or ability or eventually lack of ability to use appliances, power tools, uh, weapons, wood stoves, driving, etc. Um, another big concern about safety is um, a very common uh, secondary sign of Alzheimer's disease, and that is wander. Well, two-thirds of people with Alzheimer's will wander, meaning I don't particularly like that term because to the person they may not experience it as wandering, they're going to go out the front door and just keep going. And because of the changes to their brain, they, they may be searching for something. Maybe they're going to work. Maybe they're finding uh, the, where they grew up. Maybe they're searching for a family member. We may never know where they're going or why, but they tend to go in a straight line. They tend to go downhill into water or get caught up in brambles. Um, uh, they won't call out for help because they're not going to recognize that they're in need of help. If they go out in this temperature with no coat or gloves on, eventually they will die from exposure. And so in Maine, we have legislation that allows us to react immediately. It's called a silver alert legislation. It's like the Amber Alert, where uh, if there is a missing elder with Alzheimer's or dementia, we can initiate immediate search and rescue. So one of the few services that there is a fee associated with is our Medic Alert Safe Return Program. So you're probably familiar with the bracelets, the Medic Alert bracelet. Um, a nice feature of that program is that the caregiver also gets a bracelet. So if they get in a car accident, they, they're incapacitated the first responders will see that they are a caregiver of someone with dementia at home. So it's a little safety net there. And there's also a GPS monitoring service called Comfort Zone, which again adds a layer of safety and support. Uh, so we go through all of that when we talk to people about going through the an assessment, through this care consultation and information referral. We have over 40 support groups across the state for caregivers. We have two in, locally. We have one at Seniors Plus and one at Clover Manor. Um, we're developing and starting support groups for people in early stage disease for themselves. Um, we also are developing what we refer to as um, social engagement programs for people in early stage who can get together and have fun together. We have lots of activities. As a matter of fact, today, um, the individual you and I spoke about, Suzanne Mark Pachinik, is at Bates Museum with a group of folks in early stage doing a tour of the museum. And we go for a walks, walks in uh, Audubon places, we go bowling, we go to the symphony. So we, we gather together to really connect people, social connection, intellectual stimulation, having a good time. Um, we have this monthly event in our office called uh, Lunch and Games. Pretty raucous, I'm trying to concentrate and do my job and they're having a, a great time and laughing. Their favorite game is Fact or Crap. 
So, you know, you can, you know I don't, I've never played that game, but they're having a great time playing it. And they're having fun, and they're connecting. Caregivers can attend. And so it's a way to stay connected and have a good time and not withdraw and not be, not be isolated. Education, uh, community programs like this, training for professionals also, and I mentioned the safety services. Well, yes. I'm society for these, That's a good one as well. Um, something that was very interesting for me to learn was that um, you may mention around people's um, ability to still experience emotional pleasures. Yes. And I thought maybe you could speak on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, that, what Susanna's referring to, uh, we're talking about um, the, really the first sign that emerges with <coughs> memory impairment or with Alzheimer's is memory impairment. And it's the part of the brain that takes in newly learned information. It's called the hippocampus. So it's like the brain's filing cabinet of the brain. You know, if you wanted to file some of this information in a folder so you could find it later, you would label it and put it away alphabetically. So then you could go get it. That's what the hippocampus does to newly learned information. It compares the information with what we already have in our brain, already stored before the disease is affected. It. That's why people can still remember remote memory because the memories are still there. Uh, and then they can recall it. There's another part of the brain called the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain. And that's, uh, that's a real key concept around caring for people or relating to people with Alzheimer's disease. So while on one hand we know that cognitive memory fades, emotional memory does not fade. And we can connect with people right up to the end, very late in the disease, possibly right to the end of the illness on an emotional basis. And that's a real key aspect of connecting and caring for someone with dementia, with Alzheimer's, is establishing that positive emotional state of joy, contentment, safety, security and then maintaining that sort of activity and that connection throughout the day. So thanks for reminding me of that. So the cognitive memory, the hippocampus, the emotional memory, um, the amygdala are real two key uh, aspects of how we translate all this academic stuff into actual care of someone with dementia. Um, the other way to get involved is through advocacy. So you might be familiar with the Walk to End Alzheimer's. We have a walk here. In Lewiston every year, it's in the fall, we have 11 walks around the state. Um, people volunteer, people get involved in writing congressmen and senators. Um, we have a um, strong advocacy outreach to connect with Senators Collins and King and all of our representatives to make sure that they're following through with the National Alzheimer's Project Act, which is a, a sort of a national blueprint. And we have a first ever main state plan for Alzheimer's, which also requires ongoing advocacy. So. Um, you might be interested, or if you have any questions about how to get involved on an advocacy basis, there's lots of different ways to do that. We need volunteers. We need people to really be interested in and in, in be involved in this. Uh, whether most people who do get involved are personally touched by the disease, uh, they've experienced it in a family member or a friend or themselves, and uh, they want to make a difference and they want to find a cure. So if you notice the signs, Remember, we want to destigmatize it. We want to talk about it, see a doctor, find out what, what's causing it, find out what treatments are required, follow the treatments, follow up resources from the Alzheimer's uh, Association, and call us anytime. So we have a few minutes left for any questions, either to go back over any of the signs or anything else about any dementia or any services or anything else I can answer for you. All right. I'll be here for a few minutes, so if you have any questions, feel free to come on up. And thank you very much for your interest in this. And uh, for those of you who came in later, there's some brochures over there. Feel free to take a uh, copy or copies of those. So thank you, and thank you to Susan for the invitation to uh, come on up. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.